This video, of course, is addressed to Kent Hovind. However, in being realistic, I know he's never going to see or acknowledge this video. So this is really intended for anyone who follows him or watches his videos. Of course, Kent has made it abundantly clear that he doesn't tolerate swearing or harsh criticism. I'm going to preempt that and say right now that there is absolutely no profanity, there are no personal attacks, and on top of that, I'm going to try and keep things as simple as I can. Further, I'm not going to make any claims as to whether evolution or creationism is true or false. It has no impact on what I'm going to be talking about here. So let's start with this quote from Ken Hovind. Man, there are so many anti hoven videos out there. It's funny. I, I have a blast. And the stuff they do, they'll cut and paste little clips here, little sentences here and there, and make uh, put things together. And I watched one this morning. It's 6 o'clock. I've been up for a while. But uh, it was hilarious. You see, you guys have nothing else to do with your time. <laughs> go mow your grass or something. Gee whiz. Before we go anywhere from here, firstly, I want to establish that Kent here is in a position of authority. And what this means is that since he is perceived as knowledgeable and a teacher, the majority of what he says is going to be taken at face value as being true. Human minds tend to behave differently when under the influence of a perceived authority. This can have extensive effects on the individual level. In the spirit of keeping it simple, I'm not going to go into any more here, but I strongly suggest looking at the Milgram obedience experiments linked below. Although the circumstances are slightly different than what's being presented here, this does tap into the psychology of authority and illustrate the effects it has on the individual. And with that being said, it should be clearly imperative that everything Kent says be verified to be true. And given this next quote, I'm sure he will agree. I certainly don't teach anything intentionally wrong. I try to understand and know the truth and teach it. And My hope is that Kent is being honest here. And if he is then the criticism he's receiving from others should be exactly what he wants to hear. These people who are criticizing him are not only telling him he's wrong, but showing where and exactly how they're providing a lot of reasons why. So if Kent were to address what these people say, he can either correct what's wrong in what he teaches or show that he's actually correct. He does neither. One user in particular named Logic, which Ken Hovind has mentioned, has put a great deal of effort into thoroughly explaining his reasoning why Kent is wrong. However, Kent just dismissed it by calling him a coward and calling him stupid without addressing anything he said. That's the very definition of ad hominem. If he was honest, he would reconsider that and actually listen to what Logic is saying. So I know that's never going to happen. So what I'm offering here is what evolution actually claims contrasted with what Kent says it claims. Starting with this quote right here. I asked the professor, I said, do you believe you came from a rock? He re refused to answer the question. I think it was 10 times uh, I asked him during the course of the debate. And uh, I showed right from his textbook, you know, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and developed a hard rocky crust. And then it rained on the rocks for millions of years and created great oceans, which, of course, is going to contain dissolved minerals from the rocks. And then these minerals slowly got together and formed life. And then that became humans. So we came from a rock. That is exactly what they believe. They just don't like it. They don't like it pointed out so simply because it shows how just flat stupid that is. Firstly, what you're trying to refer to here is abiogenesis, not evolution. That's another topic, so I won't cover that here. Secondly, the theory of evolution doesn't concern itself with the origin of life. As long as life has some origin, then evolution can occur. In science, theories pertain to specific matters and aren't directly related or necessarily dependent on other theories, such as the relationship between evolution and abiogenesis. Let's look at three categories that are commonly referenced in these debates. The origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the diversity of life. These are three entirely separate categories from each other. Biblical creation covers all three of these topics with one single overarching creation account. In contrast, science deals with each of these topics individually, and these theories are not directly dependent on one another. People can have their own beliefs, and for example, one can believe that God created life pertaining to the origin of life, while evolution still occurred, albeit guided or invented by God. This is exactly what enables such a belief as theistic evolution. In conclusion, Kent's rock believer statements don't pertain to evolution at all. Now before you dismiss this out of hand, consider this. Would you prefer that a heroic knight defeat a dragon or an imagined version of that dragon? Unfortunately for Kent, he's attacking the imagined version of evolution. And this observation is not an attack on Kent, just something that needs to be corrected. And until he gets his arguments straight, 
he's committing a logical fallacy known as a straw man argument. With that out of the way, let's move on to another Hovind quote. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. <laughs> Never! And they won't. Firstly, let's take a look at this specific definition of macroevolution that Kent has here. Based on general usage and Kent's quote here, this entails one form of organism giving birth or changing into a radically different form of organism. One such example would be describing a crocodile giving birth to a duck. This is intentionally defined in a way to specifically make it seem absurd, because it is. Nowhere in evolutionary theory does it claim that such a radical transformation occurs. Even with the inclusion of the notion of a transitional form, that is a separate issue that's constantly misrepresented and misunderstood, but that is another topic. The bottom line here is that evolution completely agrees with this being an absurd statement. This cannot happen, and if ever this was observed and proven to happen, that would deal a potentially lethal blow to the theory of evolution. Religious opponents of evolution actually have it backwards, for if they did find anything like this, this would be evidence of something besides evolution. Now, to address Kent's quote, it's quite absurd to say that evolution claims that a dog can produce a non-dog. Such a statement is made from an utter lack of understanding of a classification system. To demonstrate this, this is a generic example of a lineage. Each level that is shown represents an identifiable difference between lineages. And as you can see, the divergence adds new classifications. It does not affect or remove the original. So no matter what level you attribute to the classification of kind, you will never see one kind turning into another kind. The only thing that changes is the addition of more refined classifications to explain these differences. Evolution does not claim a dog can produce a non-dog. That's absurd. Now regarding the nebulous term kind, that's another issue entirely. There's a duo on YouTube that go by the name Exabyte Spider. And for a better explanation on this matter, I'm going to link their video titled Helping Hovind to Understand Nested Hierarchies. So returning to the point, secondly, Let's take a look at microevolution and macroevolution as defined by Kent Hovind and compare them to how they'd be defined in evolutionary theory. Microevolution is quite similar in both, in that small mutations and adaptions lead to minor differences between organisms. For macroevolution, Kent's definition claims that large mutations are responsible for major differences between organisms, whereas evolutionary theory explains that a great number of small compounding changes are what are responsible for the major differences between organisms. So according to evolutionary theory, these two terms describe the exact same process. The only difference is the amount of time that's being considered for the observation, micro being a relatively small amount of time while macro is a relatively large amount of time. To draw an analogy, picture a staircase. One step may represent a mutation or very tiny change. Microevolution represents a few of those steps, whereas macroevolution would represent more around a hundred or a thousand of those same steps. Again, these terms refer to the exact same process over differing amounts of time. In specific relevance to this analogy, it's the amount of steps that are considered. So in conclusion, Kent's definitions and claims about evolution don't resemble what evolutionary theory entails at all. Unfortunately, Kent is once again arguing against an imaginary version of evolutionary theory. So all of these repetitive things that Kent says about evolution only serve to be straw man arguments as explained before. Additionally, through these misrepresentations, Kent is phrasing things in a way to make his opponents appear stupid. And this provides a means for discrediting the group preemptively. And this constitutes a poisoning the well fallacy. And the dangerous part about this is it reinforces and strengthens bias against that position and inhibits consideration of it, which sabotages an honest conversation. So I hope this video was clear and simple enough to understand. But if not, I'm more than happy to address questions and constructive criticism in the comments section below. Thank you for lending me some of your time.